In this video, we're going to be talking about how to use dummy members to define a more manual method of the rigid offsets we talked about in previous videos. And there are some unique applications where this may be more favorable than using dumb rigid offsets. For a bit of background, dummy members are used to connect 2D elements to members or other 2D elements. And it's really the main differentiator between rigid offsets and dummy members. Dummy members, again, are a more manual approach, but they give you more flexibility, whereas rigid offsets are really only able to work with members. But if you have something that's not a member, like a rigid, or sorry, a shell or a panel or something like that, then dummy members are certainly a good option. Now they are manually defined, so you have to define them yourselves. And there's different types of rigid members or dummy members rather. You can have them be relative, relatively rigid in the case of what we saw in the last example where you may want to connect center lines of adjacent objects, or you can have a relatively flexible dummy member. And this may be used as perhaps an insertion point for a line load in a mesh where there's no actual member to apply the mesh to, or apply the load to. So these are defined as basically a normal member that you would normally define with a member definition tool connecting two different objects, or the joints of two different objects. And depending on whether you want it to be relatively rigid or relatively flexible, you can assign either large or small sections. Now we do recommend that if you're doing this though, make sure you keep them relatively close to the section size that you would use uh, for a normal member. Don't give it, you know, one kilometer by one kilometer uh, area, for example, if it's a rigid member. Uh, that can cause issues with build conditioning in the solver. Uh, so I would recommend keeping it within a factor of about 1,000 times the stiffness of whatever it is that you're trying to uh, model. That way, you're still going to have the relatively stiff properties that you're looking for without uh, having the issues with build conditioning. We also recommend using a zero density material because that way you're not going to account for any additional mass in your model that's not really present, but just being used for analytical purposes. And to demonstrate this, we're going to go back to the model that we were looking at before. You may remember we assigned some rigid offsets to these membranes. We're going to do this a little bit differently now. Uh, so we have this rigid offset model that we were looking at earlier in the previous example. Uh, and we've used the rigid offset tool to define these rigid offsets. Actually, we use a spreadsheet. So we'll go back to the spreadsheet to delete them and go to the member spreadsheet. And here I'm just going to enter the rigid x1 over L at start joint to be zero, and the same thing at the end joint for member number three, which is my horizontal member. Now, if I go back to the geometry window, you can see that those rigid sections of the member are gone. And at this stage, I could actually go ahead and define my own properties for whatever I want it to, to represent. Now, before I do that, though, I'm going to actually create a couple of extra nodes here. So just for a little bit of background, we want to create a rigid offset that's roughly representative of the section size that we're using here on the beam. And knowing that this beam here is five meters long, I just left clicked with the joint tool at the top of this column. It's going to represent 10% of its length. So I'm going to use the member tool, the member definition tool, and I'm going to left click about half a meter down from this member length here, uh, this member connection here. And we're going to have this subdivide connecting member dialog pop up, and it's going to ask me how far from the eye joint do you want this joint to be? And I'm going to say 0 0.5 meters. And now it's added a joint there, but it wants me to define a member. However, I don't actually need to define a member. I'm just going to hit the escape button, and I'm left with just this one joint here that was defined at that location. And I could do the same thing on the other end as well. I can just left click near the J joint of that member. And once again, we can see here that we're presented with this information. And so now I need to define how this information goes into the model. Uh, so in this case here, the member length is nine and a half meters. I think I was incorrect when I said it was five meter long member before. I was looking at the wrong axis, that was the Z axis. Uh, but in this case here, I want this to be maybe, uh, I'm gonna say nine meters long. 
uh, 9 meters away from the inode. Now this is a new inode because I've introduced a new joint into this analytical member. So the member length originally was 9.5 meters. I want the second joint to be 9 meters away from the start point, which is half a meter away from the end point. So I'll press OK again, add that extra joint, and then I can just press Escape, and we're all good to go. Now I'm going to define a custom section here. Using the Section Properties tool, I'm just going to right-click, and I'm going to click on the Shapes button. And within this Shapes button here, I can define a custom shape section representative of whatever properties I'd like it to represent. In this case here, I'm just going to use a square section, and I want this to be a rigid section relative to my W920 by 201 section. So I'm going to say that it's 1,000 millimeters by 1,000 millimeters. And I'll press OK. You can see the properties that have been calculated for this section. I'll just say rigid section, give it a name and press add. If we just compare the two, we can see that there is a difference between the moments of inertia and so on uh, for this section versus the real section. We could have gone larger if we wanted to. I chose to use this one, but again, it comes down to whatever your preference is. One thing I'm gonna zero out here though is the shear areas. I don't want any shear areas in this model, so or in this member. So I'm just gonna press uh, zero here to make those zero and click Update. Now click Close, and I'm going to apply this rigid section just to these end components here that I see there. And for the member material, I'm going to use the Material Properties tool. You can see that by default it's using material number one, which is a steel material. But if I right click, I can create a copy of that material because remember that I don't want to contribute that extra self weight of that portion of the member that's one meter square and made of steel. That's going to contribute a lot of extra self-weight. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to create a copy of this material and I can do that by just left clicking to select it and then press the add button. It's going to take whatever content of the selected material I have as kind of the template and I'll just say I'll call this material zero density and I'm going to give the force density if currently it's 0 0.000077. I'm going to say that's zero newtons per millimeter cube. And I'll say update. Now I have this new material that's made of the steel material properties without any force density. And I'll click close and I can use this zero density material to apply to these rigid components. However, this is not a completely automated process like what we saw with the rigid offset. So a few of the things that we have to think about are our releases. Notice here that we have our releases still at the very end of the member. And if I go to options releases, you can see that they're at the end of the member, which in this case is the rigid component of the member. I'm going to get rid of those here and just place them at the end of the elastic component of the members. And if I go to the loads window, I can see here under loads, if I just look at my loads, I've got the 20 kilonewton per meter loads on these ends as well, which I don't actually want. So I'm going to get rid of those as well. And you can kind of see some of the drawbacks of this approach if we're using members. However, this is also useful if we're working with uh, connecting shell elements to different objects uh, because the member approach doesn't work with the rigid offsets. Now if I go ahead and run this analysis, I can click Analyze, OK. We get a clean solution. And now I can go ahead and look at the results. And I can look at the moment diagrams. And I can see the results I'm getting. So they're fairly similar to what I got for the rigid offsets approach. Uh, the maximum moment is quite similar to what we saw. I think it was around 680 before. Uh, we're getting similar amounts of moments in our column as well. But one thing you do notice here is that even though this is rigid, uh, the other approach that we used didn't have any moments developing in this rigid component of the member. Whereas here we're getting about 99 kilonewton meters at this one end. Uh, so that's something that is a little bit different between the two, although that is 
it does have some inherent flexibility built into it, whereas the other approach uses a fully rigid uh, segment of, of the member to, to transfer those forces. But this allows us to see the shear forces that are being transferred um, and more details on that sort of thing.